All right, we are in conversation with regards to uh, Professor Helen Rees. We'll come back to her in a short while. I want to take you now first to Port Elizabeth. Taxi drivers there are up in arms. They're protesting against the lockdown regulations, limiting the number of passengers they can transport. Drivers say they cannot afford to transport fewer passengers given the high uh, price of petrol. Scores of drivers have gathered at the Njoli Square today, asking for this decision to be revised, saying they're working at a loss. We're going to try to get our reporter, Anda Ngonji, uh, in the Eastern Cape in a short while. Is Anda ready? No, she's not. All right, Anda is there. Anda, very good morning to you. Uh, okay, we understand that Anda is not uh, quite ready. So we'll come back to Anda with regards to that story. But I want to get uh, back to the Professor Helen Reese with regards to you know, what can we expect going forward in terms of this vaccine? What, where are we in the fight against uh, COVID-19? It's uh, all hands on deck. South Africa is participating in this public health emergency solidarity trial that uh, has been initiated by the World Health Organization to conduct a, a clinical trial to find this effective treatment for, for COVID-19. The South African Solidarity Research Team is led by uh, Professor Helen Rees and uh, Jeremy Nell, working with 30 senior academics, researchers, clinicians from eight medical schools in the country. The professor very kindly decided to stay with us. Thank you, Prof, uh, for, for sticking around. We appreciate your time. We appreciate your perspective. Let's get a sense of, you know, in terms of the economics of, of this and the health system, it seems that the health world and the economic world, the financial world, is going head to head. And both as you know, are hurting. Is, it, is there room to do this incrementally in terms of this lockdown? Get some businesses working in the meantime so as to not smash the economy to smithereens? Or is it you know, all or nothing? We go in with regards to our fight against COVID-19 and do nothing else until that's dealt with. What's your take? Well, I think we, we can look at the from uh, Wuhan mm. <clears throat> because there they did a very drastic lockdown and I mean China is a unique society in the sense that it can do something like that um, but mo many societies including our own will, will battle t to do something as drastic but if you look at Wuhan two months on they have really massively reduced the numbers of cases the other thing that we should just think about is that um, if we, can, if we can give ourselves breathing space, if we can flatten the curve yeah. instead of this very high peak that we flatten the curve and we have far fewer cases and our health services can, can cope better, um, this is going to be good because during that time, we will hopefully in the next few months, we will get better at understanding, for example, what drugs are good for treatment. Yeah. So it's better for people who are very ill. And we'll also get better at, we are doing other studies that are looking at drugs that can be used to protect, for example, our healthcare workers. So we've got treatment for the sick, but we also want to protect people who are vulnerable. Yeah. And particularly in the first instance, our healthcare worker uh, population. So we will get all of, we'll, we'll be getting more information. We'll know how to do this better. If we can flatten that curve, it will be better. But for South Africa, definitely, we're going to have to do that very careful balancing between the public health, what we want to do definitely for public health, and how do we make sure that, that people who are particularly living in, in, in informal settlements and difficult settings where there's unemployment, how do we make sure that we also look after people so that they have food um, and that they, their basic needs are met throughout this period. So this, we're going to have to balance this. And it's going to be something, and, and this is definitely what government and the president has done. He's pulled together and the Minister of Health have pulled together the country's best experts to continuously look at this and say, what's the next step? If this is happening, how do we adjust? There isn't a recipe for this that will give us a definite cake. We're going to have to be changing this recipe as we run. We're building the ship as we, as we sail it. Prof, I know you're a medical expert, so I don't want to enter the political realm with you, but what's, what's your take? You, you reckon that government has done a good job so far in trying to curb this, uh, this virus? 
Well, I'm part of what's called the Ministerial Advisory Committee. So um, I'm having continuous discussions with the, the minister, with the Department of Health, um, and through them with the presidency as well. So I'm listening to many people's inputs. I, I and, and I'm, uh, despite, I'm, I'm saying that as a disclaimer, yeah. but I have been extraordinarily impressed by the coming together of just about everybody. We've seen not only the public sector in terms of health, but the private sector. We've seen the private sector who are not involved with health putting money in to support and be directed in, in, in what they should do. We've seen civil society, gift of the givers. We've seen the whole of civil society trying to say, what can we do? And in fact, it, it, even before this, I get more calls from people saying, I want to do something. What can I do? What can I do? This is truly a galvanized uh, national effort that has got all sectors of our society. But from a leadership perspective, I have been extremely impressed by what has been pulled together and the urgency with which uh, that happens. And, and to give you a cameo, I had a phone call this morning saying uh, early to say, we need this and we need this today. And from someone else saying, we need this and we need this today. So everyone is, is understanding that whether it's test kits, whether it's apps, whether it's um, uh, protection for healthcare workers that we don't have enough of at the moment, everyone is trying to do their bit, either through invention, re-scoping, re, uh, manufacturing lines. Everyone has pulled together. I think it's been impressive. We've got, but we've got to keep at it because we are... We, we're only at the starting of, of, of this process yeah. now, and we're going to be, this is going to be with us for months. Well, let's talk about that in terms of where we are at this stage. It's important to note, Professor, that COVID-19 was only found in humans just over three months ago. It feels much longer than that. If you, if you look at the pandemic in general, at what stage are we as a nation? How, how would you plot the timeline? Well, I mean, the timeline is going to be determined by how we respond as a nation. Because if we all go about our business and we don't go into a lockdown and we, we decide to ignore um, that curve that you've seen so many times, that epidemic curve is going to go up very steeply and then it'll come down. But that means that many, 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 many people, millions of people in our setting, will get this infection mm. very quickly. And that will overwhelm not only the healthcare sector, it'll overwhelm our, our it'll, 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 it'll cause civil disruption. If you have that many people who are sick, mm. businesses closed, we cannot reopen them. So what we're trying to do very definitely is, is, is instead of that, we're trying to get this curve to do this. Yeah. Um, and that's, yeah. that's possibly a longer process. Mm. And so that's why I'm saying along the way, we're going to have to say, how do we do that, but keep our economy alive, yeah. um, keep, it, keep it fluid, make sure that people have access to all of the basics. Um, and so, but everyone's going to have to come on this journey together. There's no point people saying, as we just heard, uh, you understand why the taxis are angry. This is difficult. Mm. But actually, if you put everyone into a taxi like that, you are going to spread this outbreak incredibly quickly yeah. and you're back to that. That is going to be worse in the long run for all of us. And that, that's what's meant when you, we were talking about flattening the curve is where you spread out yeah. the number of infections over a longer period of time so you don't overburden uh, the health system. And in so many places, not in, only in South Africa, but in, around Africa, it's, it's, it's compromised in terms of the health system. People are battling. Uh, you know, doctors around the world, when you look at Italy, uh, you, you see and the number of doctors that are being infected with the virus. Speaking about Italy, oh, I'd like to get your take, uh, Professor, with regards to what went wrong there. We know from studies and from reports that we know that Italy has a, a lot of older people. The population is mainly of the elderly. They have a longer you know, life expectancy, so to speak. Is that part of the reason why we're seeing so many deaths there? Well, I, I'm sure there'll be a, you know, history will allow us to analyze and understand that better. Mm. Uh, as you say, one of the issues with Italy is that um, whereas our, our age pyramid is, is like this, it's like a triangle, and we've got many young people at the bottom, 
Italy is the opposite. Yeah. It's got fewer young people and many more old people at the top. And old people are not only more likely to die with this infection, and it goes up, it goes starts to go up after 60, and it goes more steeply after 70, and, and it goes quite steeply after 70, really. So not only are older people more likely to die, but they're more likely to contract the infection as well. Yeah. So, uh, so it's not only the people that you see are dying, but remember that that represents a large number of people who have got the infection who will be occupying hospital beds. And this infection isn't quick. It, it's not, it's not uh, like a, a common cold that you can get and get over within a few days. It grounds on very often um, for one week, two weeks, three weeks, even up to six weeks, people can be really disabled. Now, if you're sick and you're occupying a hospital bed and you're really not well, even if you eventually recover, if you occupy that hospital bed for three, four, five weeks, you can imagine that there are many that are simply not going to get access to a hospital bed. Yeah. So, um, so, so in terms of Italy, that was definitely part of it. Part of it was also that perhaps they responded too late, that they should have done more drastic measures earlier. Um, and part of it might be to do with just, you know, how, how people live, the socialization, yeah. where people congregate, how many urban settings do you have. Yeah. Um, so so yeah. part of it is probably it's going to be a combination of all of those things. Um, but we heard today, for example, that Hungary has declared a state of emergency mm -hmm. very, very early on. They haven't waited to get, uh, uh, you know, 100, 200, 300 patients or some deaths. They've done it very early on. So I think people are beginning to look at Italy and say, actually, uh, and the same with South Korea, lesson also learned there. Right. China could have done it earlier, but was able to do a draconian shutdown. Mm. Many countries can't do that. Yeah. Uh, the earlier yeah. you do it, the better, and the more aggressive you are, which is what uh, President Ramaphosa was, right. is, trying, was trying to, is now trying to do. The more aggressive you are in trying to identify people and isolate them, the better. Weigh in, Professor, on the, the current debate that is taking place in South Africa. I'm not sure if we should be debating this or not. You can tell us better. You're in a much better position to advise us to use a mask or not to use a mask, to use gloves or not to. WHO tells us that only people who have the virus should be using the mask because they are protocols. They are the proper way in order to use a mask. There's a difference between the surgical mask and the N95 mask. Weigh in, Professor, settle this for us once and for all. What should we be doing? Uh, well, the first thing on the N95 mask, these are the, uh, they're, they're, they're um, actually made in a different way and have different components to them. And they really do, uh, uh, if properly worn, are able to exclude viruses, bacteria. <clears throat> we don't have enough of them in the country and those masks must be preserved for our healthcare workers, our frontline workers. Right. We've got to look after our frontline workers. And so if anyone has them or is anyone's trying to get them and, and you just want them for home use, please don't. Because that means that's a, a, a nurse, a doctor, a pharmacist who's not going to have access to that. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that we definitely know that when people have symptoms, that's when they are most infectious. So it's when they cough, they sneeze, they touch their faces, they're most infectious. That's where you really want to have um, the, the more simple masks, and we want to give those to people. Anyone with a symptom, we want them to wear it. The minute you get that symptom, put it on. Even in your home, around your family, when you go to a healthcare facility for advice, you must try and wear a mask of some sort that will, that will uh, keep the virus sort of localized. That's a definite and that we are also recommending. Mm. Now, um, what you're seeing is, is that some people are highly exposed to other people will be wearing masks. Um, if the other person um, is asymptomatic, is quite well, um, even if they have the virus, they're not going to be as infectious as somebody who's got symptoms. But people who are highly exposed uh, are, are sitting uh, say at a at, at a pharmacy counter, mm. um, and they're seeing a lot of people. People at uh, the airport when 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 planes come in. Um, the, the evidence really doesn't say whether this is really going to help, but I think there might well be something psychological. Yeah. That if I'm going to see a lot of people, I am going to feel 
a little bit more protected if I'm covering. However, that depends if we have the masks. Um, we are rushing now to identify local manufacturers who can make more of these masks. And as I said, many people are now volunteering to redirect manufacturing lines. We've got, um, I saw even yesterday, people who are looking at 3D printing of masks who've taken it from uh, a New York initiative and have just developed a 3D visor mask that will cover that we can print locally that we could make locally well so once we have more masks i think that we're going to be more comfortable to say uh you know why do you use uh, if it makes people feel more comfortable the evidence the most the strongest evidence we have is is for healthcare workers at high risk on the front line and for people who are symptomatic that's what we should be prioritizing at the moment all right and what about uh, gloves uh, professor very quickly um well, again, gloves are not necessarily easy to come by. The problem with gloves is, are you going to just use the glove and then handle lots and lots and lots of things? Yeah. Um, the good thing about using your hands is that you, you come away and you'll wash them because you know you've handled lots of things. You know you've been to a shop. You'll wash it, you'll wash it, you'll use hand sanitizer. So gloves uh, are something that if people are delivering goods and so on, that they could use, but they have to be, you can't keep using them. But because if you get the virus onto it and then you handle it, it's like your hands. You're just going to spread yeah. it. And the problem with gloves is people won't necessarily wash, wash the glove, yeah. nor should they. And they yeah. won't necessarily dispose of them. So under certain circumstances, uh, gloves might be wise. But for the ordinary person, just be aware of what you're doing with your hands. Hand yeah. sanitize and wash, wash, wash. These are important answers to questions that many who are watching us now at home have. And we do appreciate your time, Professor Professor Helen Reese, one of the uh, South African Solidarity Research Team Leaders. We thank you very much for your insight and perspective. Be well.